Well, morning, everyone. I've got to say, um, it's a real treat to be led in worship, isn't it, by people whose craft is anointed by the Spirit. Real treat. Uh, I didn't know there was going to be so many parties today, I have to say. It's, uh, I, I was real privileged to be here for that as well, though I wasn't uh, terribly happy with Lydia saying that, uh, you know, if it said LBC on it, it had to be so old. <laughs> I didn't really mind for myself, but for my wife, it was quite painful. <laughs> I ha- actually, I remember the first time that, that a female president was elected. It was a day of great joy and re- great joy and enthusiasm in the college at that time. Uh, I think they've, since then, they've outnumbered men eight to one or whatever it is. Who knows? <laughs> well, I know you've been looking at the prophets this term. Uh, prophets, obviously, sometimes warning, sometimes comforting, sometimes predicting the future but often highlighting, don't they, some principle from the revealed word of God um, that the people are ignoring. I mean, in a sense, you don't, Amos doesn't tell people new news. God is concerned for the poor. God is concerned for the widow. God is concerned for the orphan. God is concerned for the foreigner. That's not new news, but he sends Amos to highlight that truth to the church at a particular time. Now, as it happens, uh, I've been given permission to speak on whatever I like, which is a very dangerous uh, thing to do, really. Um, I much appreciate the reading, by the way. Some of you perhaps can tell I come from a Jewish background, if you can't make an appointment with your optician. And, um, and so, so to hear all that, so the Elohim, the Ben Elohim, and the Shalom, and the Mashiach, thank you for that. So um, I've been given permission to speak on whatever I like. And so I want to focus on a biblical truth, I think, that... Uh, I think God is highlighting to his church, particularly in our time, a truth that is really easily, swiftly acknowledged, but actually very rarely lived out and has, I think, enormous implications for the role of all God's people in mission at this time. But before I get to that, uh, just a little bit of personal background uh, so uh, you know where I'm coming from. Some of you do know a bit of this. Uh, I used to work in advertising, and so you can trust every word you hear from me (laughs) Uh, this afternoon now pretty much and every picture you see (laughs) now I don't know what what kind of work you've done before but I I spent 10 years working in advertising in London and in New York and I absolutely loved it I loved the people I loved the pace I loved the creativity and the lunches were just awesome (laughs) (laughs) Um, but my testimony is this I saw God do God the king of the universe do amazing things in that advertising agency. I I saw him answer prayer on prayer. I saw him heal someone on the 10th floor of a Madison Avenue advertising agency in the middle of the day. I saw him impact the work itself. I saw him change the heart of probably the most difficult client in the world. I saw him guide me through career disappointment, character failure, most of us have one or two of, of those, and romantic catastrophes, with the emphasis on the plural. But ultimately, God at work, God at work, um, in an ordinary job among ordinary people in a fairly ordinary workplace. Is there really any place that God cannot work? Is there anyone he cannot work through who submits himself or herself to him? Is there any context that by his spirit he cannot change? Then I came back to the UK, studied here, and was here, as you heard, for many years and then I went to the London Institute and when I'm asked about London Institute I I normally illustrate it using um, one of the probably greatest of all post-war British heroes doesn't necessarily say a lot about us that this is true but here is a man who can be relied on to save the world once every three years and of course that man is Bond James Bond (laughs) now Bond James Bond is not widely acclaimed in Christian circles for reasons I hope you are aware of (laughs) Uh, though I suspect there's probably not a man in this room who has not at some point imagined himself to be Bond, James Bond, perhaps even Joost, far away. <laughs> and uh, I, I, have, I have some evidence to prove this, as it happens. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, as you know, Daniel Craig is about to retire from this role, so be nice to Mark, or you may lose him to Broccoli, broccoli & Co., uh, but I, I do need to tell you, he's not the only one going for it. There is also this person <laughs> <laughs> who genuinely believes that his Scottish in- heritage will be making perfect for the role, the next Sean Connery. But of course, as you've heard, there are also rumours that we may get our very first female Bond, and so she is. <laughs> there you go. So Putin 
Putin will take over the MI6 as well. <laughs> of course, uh, not, not many of us, not many of us are uh, like Bond. Most of us are a bit more like Johnny English. That's him, if you don't know. <laughs> sort of that kind of stuff. Now, Bond, it's important in culture, when you look at culture, to see the things that are positive. Bond has many qualities worthy of praise. He's courageous, he's persevering, he's resourceful, he's the master of technology, never its slave. He is decisive and he's patriotic. He may, like Samson, sleep with the enemy, but unlike Samson, he never gives away secrets critical to national security. He's strong, agile, uh, multi-skilled, intelligent, witty, cultured and, and honest. And as one woman screamed out at a seminar, He's gorgeous. <laughs> He's also a male chauvinist pig. He is an emotional desert and he is a spiritual black hole. But apart from that, <laughs> when Bond, James Bond goes on his missions to save the world, five things are true. He is briefed properly. He is trained properly. He is resourced properly. He is commissioned. He is sent out into the world with authority to do what he's been given to do, and he is supported. But if we ask ourselves, and we've done lots of research globally on this, whether adult Christians feel themselves to be properly briefed, trained, resourced, commissioned, and supported for their role in their everyday Monday, Saturday lives, well, what would they tell us? On the whole, they tell us that they do not feel that is the case. And it was because, if you like, of this disinterest in people's Monday to Saturday ordinary lives that a man called Stott, John Stott, uh, founded the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity way back in the 80s. Stott, he's the one on the right, in case you're wondering. Because <laughs> uh, he saw with great clarity that nationally and indeed globally, across the denominations, across the streams, across the theological institutions, across the local churches, Christians were struggling to connect this living word of the Bible to the challenges and opportunities that people faced in their daily lives out there in the world. In the year 2000, there was not a single denomination in the UK strategically focused on making whole life disciples. Not one. And today there are six. Now the question really is, how can it be that local churches do not really vigorously empower their people for everyday mission? Which brings us to these magnificent texts from Paul, not usually seen as prophetic, perhaps. So as you know, he's writing to this Christian community in Colossae, modern-day Turkey. You know about this. It's a smallish town in the empire with its temples and its shrines, with its marketplace and bars, its bars and brothels. And in amongst that, there's a smallish church meeting in people's houses, slaves and masters, husbands and wives, children, working out what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus in our context at this time. And to them, Paul, having laid out the glory of the gospel in chapter 1, which we'll come back to, having reminded them of the fullness that they have in Christ, right where they are, having reminded them that they indeed have been raised in Christ to sit at the right hand of the throne of the Father, having exhorted them to let Christ's peace in the turmoil of the empire, let Christ's peace reign in them. He says to them in chapter 3, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever, what has he left out? Whatever, the hoovering and the dishes and the feeding of the dog, making beds at home or in a hospital, making a meal at home or in a restaurant or up in the kitchen right now, writing reports, writing an essay, taking a library book back early. <laughs> Wonder of wonders, miracle of miracles, or at least on time. <laughs> making an arrest, running a business, giving a client financial advice, changing a nappy that overfloweth <laughs> unto the Lord. Really, you cannot be serious as old people say. 
And then because Paul wants to make sure that everyone knows that he really means whatever, he says this to slaves, whatever you do, you slaves, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Now, I, I, I wonder who believes these verses. I imagine that here we are at the London School of Theology. The cradle of really, in the 20th century, the cradle, and in some places, in, in, in a way, a beacon of orthodoxy, the place that held the line on the reliability of Scripture in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, when the world was saying no, and the academic institution was saying it was impossible. This place, of course, you believe these verses. It's good to know, but I have been in very, 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 very few churches where these verses are operationally true where the builder is as valued as the barrister, where the homemaker is as valued as the CEO, where the cleaner is as valued as the cleric, where people doing any kind of work that isn't church paid is as valued as those who do church paid work. Now, as you know, the context here is not a reference to church work. It's not a reference to evangelism. It's not a reference to social work. It's not a reference to healthcare or to teaching or to any of the jobs that we in the Christian community regard as kosher, if you like. It's addressed to slaves. And 50% of people in the ancient world and Greco-Roman world were slaves, which meant they did lots of different kinds of work. Tilling fields and managing households, cleaning, keeping accounts, so on. So Paul's statement here is a, a statement about all forms of labour, if you like. Whatever you do, do it with all your heart. And uh, we heard that about the committee, didn't we? All those whatevers. One level, not necessarily all holy things at one level. Or are they? All those whatevers. All those whatevers that go to make a community, that go to make a society, that go to make a civilization. And the Lord God would hardly ask us to do whatever we do with all our heart unless it's somehow of genuine significance to him. So it wasn't, as you know, the malicious invention of some divine, sadistic dictator but was given us to, to us before the fall. It's part of the original plan. It remains part of the plan even though, as you know, and uh, <laughs> by the sweat of your prow, you will write your essays. Uh, so our everyday work matters because we do it for God and it matters so much, curiously, that whatever we may be paid for it uh, or whatever you may be paid for the work you do when you leave, however badly or well your earthly boss, supervisor, tutor, lecturer, dean or principal treats you, there is a heavenly reward from the Lord Christ. An astonishing idea. Radically, again, amazingly, Paul says to slaves that they will receive an inheritance. Now, in the Greco-Roman world, only sons got an inheritance. That's why Job is so radical, making sure his daughter's got one too. So Paul is telling slaves that, slaves, that they are sons and daughters of the king of the universe. The last shall be the first, the lowest, the highest. He's trying to help them see themselves in a totally different way. And you see this throughout the New Testament. We're so familiar with these words, like you're an ambassador for Christ. It's a big word to say to somebody who's a slave. It's a big word to say to somebody who's a merchant in a, in a time when that wasn't particularly well looked at. Looked at. Or a big word to say to a labourer, you're an ambassador for Christ. You're a saint. That's a big word. These are big words. Paul, Paul and Peter are asking us to reimagine our identity in Christ. I thought I was just a plumber, just a carer, just a secretary, just a housewife. And when you meet the Archbishop of Canterbury, as, as one does, he doesn't say, I'm just the Archbishop of Canterbury. We're children of the King. I wonder if, we're, if it's deep in us. I wonder if it's deep in our communities. Because you see, the, you know, our, our research reveals that most Christians in the United Kingdom believe that if they're not called to some form of uh, church-paid work, overseas mission or something, that they are second-class citizens. And there are only three ways that they can do anything for God. One is to volunteer in the church. Second one is to do direct social action. And the third one is to have an evangelistic conversation. Now, what Paul does here, his whatever, shatters those metrics, shatters those measures of what godly holy life looks like. 
See, this is very good news for most people on the planet. Because if doing five loads of washing isn't significant to God, if stacking shelves cannot be done for God, if cleaning streets cannot be done for God, if plumbing cannot be done for God, if God is actually not interested in those things, then what am I doing with my life? What are 98% of Christians doing with their lives? They're just wasting them. Well, of course, most Christians will say that they know that everything is significant to God. Because it's clear. It's right there. But I wonder, is that the character of our communities? Who do we value in the church? Who do we pray for in the church? Here's a teacher. She says this, I spend an hour a week teaching Sunday school and they haul me up to the front of the church to pray for me. Quite right. What's the second half of the quote? Well, the rest of the week I'm a full-time teacher and the church has never prayed for me. Well, the church is not saying, are they? Consciously saying, you know that one hour, 60 minutes you spend you know, doing stuff on Sunday in the children? We're not saying that that's actually more important than the 45 or 50 hours you spend in the week, but actually we are saying it. Because one we pray for, the other one we don't. Where your, your prayer is where your, or your heart is where your prayer is. And you may say, well, that doesn't apply here. And indeed it may not. It may not. You'll be feeling familiar with John Lang. Uh, this building uh, has been named after him, so is the annual lecture, which was absolutely, well, th- the one in Emmanuel was fantastic. Uh, who knows what the one like here was, but <laughs> I'm sure it's great. I've been to about 20 of them over the years, because I'm so old. <laughs> and... Uh, He's usually introduced as a philanthropist. Uh, Sometimes it's also said that he was a Carlisle builder and he was very generous to the college and in fact very very generous to literally hundreds of Christian causes and uh, his money still fuels many things. But the reality is that he was an outstanding disciple of Christ and he changed the whole construction industry. He looked at it and he saw it with different lenses. He pioneered higher standards of health and safety in the 20s and 30s for his employees. He offered sick pay, bad weather pay, no one had ever done that before, holiday pay, long before these things became statutory requirements. He created employee saving schemes for school fees and holidays at a time when most workers didn't even have a bank account. He cared about his people and changed an industry for the better. In his time, justice rolled like a river through the land corporation. There was a booklet written for children about him and a big fat biography. Dangerous, isn't it? We remember him for his philanthropy. We remember him for his contribution to the church, not his contribution to the kingdom. Whatever you do can be done for Jesus. It's tough to live it as a community. Of course, we know that Jesus is Lord, that all is important to him. But let me drift into places where angels fear to tread, youth work. (laughs) I wonder if anyone here could give me a theology of mathematics, a biblical view of mathematics. There is normally one human in the room. It does seem like a very smart aleck, a ridiculous question. Why would I need a theology of maths? But how many of you did maths at school as a matter of interest? Uh, Could we have a little bit of Pentecostal interaction? Thank you very much. (laughs) Uh, And you did it if you grew up in Britain, at least, one day a week, five days a week. One hour a day, sorry, five days a week, 40 weeks a year, for between 11 and 12 years, until you're around 16 years old, a year or two longer if you were very good at it, and a year or two longer if you were very bad at it. (laughs) And half of you at least grew up in the local church. If I ask you, can you think theologically about something that you spend all this time doing, is that actually a ridiculous question? Is it a ridiculous question? particularly when mathematics is so, so fundamental to how we steward human civilization today. And actually that applies across the curriculum. Most Christian children make choices about what they're going to study at GCSE, what they're going to study at A-level, what they're going to do at uni without any robust theology of vocation or of work or any real grasp of the scope of the ways that God, they could serve God fruitfully without becoming a worship leader or a pastor. Praise God for worship leaders and pastors. And those young people are in your churches and in mine. And it's also the same with university students. 
I'd suggest that less than 5% of Christian university students could give you a biblical view of the subject they are studying to degree level. And if you can't think Christianly when you're studying engineering, why would you think about it Christianly when you practice it? This is a deep cultural problem. So if we want to see justice roll like a river in construction, in tech, in marketing, in publishing, in advertising, well, we better believe that whatever matters to God. Now, this has led, this, this narrow view of what's important to God has led to a mission strategy that says yes and amen enthusiastically, and rightly so, to neighbourhood and local, local initiatives. Church in, in the UK is brilliant at this and has never been really so creative. And it says yes and amen, and rightly so, to overseas mission. But overall, most of our communities ignore, the, if you like, where 98% of people, that is those who are not ordained, spend 95% of their lives out in the world. Now just imagine what would happen if every Christian who goes out into the world was properly empowered for that place. The difference it would make. The hours and the hours and the hours that people have to show the difference that Jesus makes to life. The years and years they have to bring his wisdom and to demonstrate his wisdom and his love to people in these sorts of places. And we won't have, if you like, three cog churches and we won't make whole life disciples until we really grasp, I suppose, the scope of the gospel and our role in the mission of God, unless that we grasp this. Now, there is something even bigger at stake here for the church at this time. Back in around 1940, in the middle of a world war, um, Dorothy Sayers, the, the author of the uh, Peter Whimsey novels and uh, the inventor of the Guinness toucan, and one of the great broadcast evangelists wrote this, and an early Christian feminist actually wrote this, in nothing has the church so lost her hold on reality as her failure to understand and respect the secular vocation. She has allowed work and religion to become separate departments and is astonished to find that as a result the secular work of the world is turned to purely selfish and destructive ends and that the greater part of the world's intelligent workers have become irreligious or at least uninterested in religion. But, she says, is it astonishing? How can anyone remain interested in a religion which seems to have no concern with nine-tenths of his or her life? Now, her point, writing in the middle of a world war, was not just about work. It was about the gospel. What she's saying is that what the church was doing was communicating not only to Christians, but to the watching world that God was really not interested in nine-tenths of their life. That's like being a teenager and having a dad who is only interested in your academic work, who is not interested in your love of music, who is not interested in you love dancing, or your, your obsession with toads, or your adventures with your two best friends, or your relentless, impossible, overwhelming crush on Joe. <laughs> it's more than an idea we're talking about. How can anyone remain interested in a Jesus? who seems to have no concern for now in of our lives. So if we do not embrace Colossians 3, uh, then we run the risk of living an incomplete gospel, a one-tenth gospel, and we run the danger of sharing an incomplete gospel. No wonder so many contemporary people reject the good news about Jesus. They have not heard the good news that the king of the universe cares about every aspect of their lives. And um, most of you are in these generations. That's precisely one of the things that generations Zers or Z, uh, or, and indeed the older ones, those ancient people, millennials, are apparently yearning for. An integrated life in which they get to be authentic. In essentially the same person at work and at home, gym and pub, an adventurous life, a purposeful life. That is what people want. And that is not what we're telling them. Not because we tell them that because that's good marketing. We tell them that because it's true. And this is what Christ offers. So why does every deed and every action and every word matter? Now that he's come and given his life, been raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of the Father and has sent his spirit to strengthen his, why does it matter? Well, one of the reasons why all our whatevers matter is because Colossians 3 is built on 
beautiful revelation of Colossians 1. Here Paul, as you know, describes Christ, the image of the invisible God, the co-creator of all things, not some things, all things. And there are seven alls in the English and one everything in that. And so we read, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and, and invisible. Things visible, stars, mountains, elephants, dolphins, toucans, the best dressed toucan in the world, that one. All things, not some things. Does Christ not love the material word he co-created with the Father by the Spirit that brooded over the face of the deep? All things, not some things, things vi- invisible. Higgs boson, electromagnetism, here's a picture of something <laughs> invisible. All things, all powers, all systems of organisational authority were created, conceived of and brought into being by Jesus. So if all things were created by Christ, why would not Jesus continue to be interested in all things, in V.Y. Canoris Major, the biggest known star, 21 billion times the size of the sun? That's why you need maths. (laughs) Why he would not be interested in the earth, and all that is in every plankton, every atom, every particle, in every aspect of life, why wouldn't he be interested in you or in me in every aspect of our lives? And it doesn't just include the material, does it? There are the thrones, the powers, the the authorities. Everything is submitted to Christ. Every Putin, every Trump, every Macron, every Johnson, every cartilage. Some of them willingly. Others clearly not so. But it's not just that all things were created by Jesus, that they're created for him. He's entrusted much to us, but it's still his. All of it is. The oceans we're filling with plastic, the rivers we're polluting, and the master will return one day and ask us what we have done. And so this Jesus, this Lord, is interested in, in whatever we do because everything we do, everything you do here on tonight, this afternoon, next week. Everything you do has an impact on his creation and has an impact on people created in his image for whom he died. And indeed, not just because he created them, because through Jesus, he came to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making shalom, eirene, through his blood shed on the cross. God the Father seeking to reconcile all things to himself, to restore all things to their right relationship with him. Renovate all things, if you like. All things, not some things. All creation, all humanity. So Christ, the co-creator. Christ, the Lord of all. Christ, the bringer of peace. Christ, the source of fruitfulness. Christ, the source and bringer of all unity. And of course, in an empire where Caesar was called Lord and Caesar promoted himself, as the bringer of peace. Caesar promoted himself as the source of fruitfulness and unity. These words are deeply subversive. It is Christ, not Caesar, who is Lord. It is Christ, not the emperor, who is the one who who will bring peace. It is Christ who is the source of fruitfulness and bounty. It is in Christ that there will be no Scythian or barbarian, Jew or Gentile. And it's he who is the reconciler of all. So this Lord invites you and me to collaborate with him in this great regeneration project, the renewal of all things. I don't know if you're familiar with a man called Tony Campolo. Um, Some of you familiar with him? He's a great American social activist. He's known to be a very quietly spoken man, very recessive in his communication. And this is what he said. He said, evangelism, evangelism is an invitation to join a movement to change the world. And if you know Tony Campolo, he he speaks with his eyes closed. I think he has the script on his eyelids. I don't know why he does that. (laughs) Now, you know and I know that evangelism is more than that, but it is never less. It's never less. We are freed from the power of sin, death, and Satan, empowered to become new creatures in Christ, to live in his ways and pursue his purposes wherever we find ourselves. And every disciple can be part of God's big plan in time and eternity. But it is vital to see that it is the Lord who takes all our whatevers and weaves them into his all. God's plan is for more, isn't it, than the salvation of souls. The Missio Dei is bigger than just getting people into the new heaven and the new earth. Praise God. God's plan is for the renewal of all things. So Jesus does come to die in our place, does take away the sin, does defeat Satan, 
and death does reconcile all things to himself. And he inaugurates a new era in human history and invites us on this day into that with him. Abundant life in Christ involves living as material human beings and involves working with him in making his world a better place wherever you find yourself. This is the great project. All our whatevers he weaves into his whole. Well, what does everything look like? I could tell you a hundred stories and I hope you'll buy one of my books sometime and read them. They're all about other people mainly. I could tell you a hundred stories. The point is that if we know that whatever we do can be done with Jesus, then we can ask for his help in whatever we do. Then we can expect his presence in whatever we do. Then we can know that God is with us in everything we do. The first person to use the words, the Lord be with you, in the Bible, was not a priest, was not a prophet. It was a farmer. It was Boaz in Ruth chapter 2. The Lord be with you, he said to his workers in the field. So when we don't really believe Colossians 1, 15 to 20, we have a limited view of who's important, which activities are important, and which places are important. But when we grasp the all-encompassing scope of this beautiful gospel of Jesus, then we walk, and anyone who follows him can walk into their everyday life knowing that there is not one square inch or millimetre of this planet about which he does not say, mine. We go into every day knowing that whether we are in a library, the kitchen, the accounts office, reception, the gym, the stud, our part-time job in the pub, the hospital, the office, he would like to bless others through that work, knowing, knowing that it's significant to him, knowing that if we ask for his help, he'll be with us. And this is obviously a message I think that the churches need to hear. Text a friend this afternoon and tell them you're praying for them in what they're doing. Ask someone in your church what they do and why they like it or why they hate it and see and ask them how they see God operating with them. Help a child see that they don't just do their homework for their parents or for their teacher, but they do it for God. And if God calls you to a job that isn't church paid and that doesn't have any cool cred in the church world, know that you can do it in him, for him, to his glory, perhaps beyond imagining and maybe change like Lang did industry. Well, if you'd like to pursue some of these things, there are some bits at the back, something called Frontline Sundays, which you can take back to your churches or have a look with some information about materials, and there's lots of stuff on the web. In the Reformation, the Word of God was given back to the people of God. I believe in our time, it is time to give the people back their everyday ministry, their everyday ministry of living out and sharing this glorious whole life gospel and in all that you do here and beyond the Lord be with you